The wonderful thing about this moment is always that you can see me, but of course I can see the light. So just let me know every so often that you're really there. <laughs> the power of love. Love. I was born into unconditional love, as was every person in this room. But what exactly is unconditional love? What does it mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? For me, it's my great-grandma, Nina. In 1939, great-grandma Nina stood at the train station in Vienna, waving goodbye to her son, his wife, and their two children. Mere weeks earlier, the family had decided they absolutely were not going to leave Vienna, that they were not going to leave Austria, because they couldn't secure one more exit visa for Nina. But Nina decided otherwise, and she announced to the family over dinner that they would absolutely leave, because if not, there wouldn't be a family. Courageous, defiant words of love. Those words saved the entire family, including Nina's granddaughter, 14-year-old Lieselot, who 10 years later gave birth to me. So without her courageous, defiant words of love, I wouldn't have been born, nor would the family have survived. So one of the things that I know is that without unconditional love, there would be no me. There would be no me standing here talking to you today. Because think of the word unconditional for a moment. I didn't exist yet. There wasn't even the imagination of me yet. And yet Nina was willing to risk her life that I, the future generation, might have the possibility to be born. I didn't deserve her love in the sense that I earned it but I received her love. Sadly, Nina paid the ultimate price and three years later was murdered in Auschwitz. But that's not, in fact, where the story either starts or ends. And if you go back just a few, mo uh, just a few weeks from that moment at the train station, what was really going on? The family was living in central Vienna, and the Nazis had come to evict the family from their apartment. They came on a Saturday, and the two children, Lisa Lott and Herbert, were doing what children often do on the weekend. They were doing their chores. Except the Nazis didn't believe that Jews did any work, and Jews weren't allowed to have hired help. So with a gun trained on him, the Nazis demanded that Lisa Lott's father pay the help, and send them on their way, which he did, and which led to Lieslot and her brother being out and quickly splitting because they figured they wouldn't get recognized as easily if they stayed together. And so Lieslot spent the next days hiding behind the elegant buildings of Vienna, hiding in the parks, until three days later she was scared, she was hungry, she was petrified, and she made it successfully to the doorstep of family friends. And as she knocked on the door, the Jans, the family friends, immediately opened the door and let her in. And in that moment, they were risking the lives of every member of the family. Now, the Jans were Catholic, as are 97% of the people in Austria, so they weren't at risk until they chose to open the door. They so believed 
in a child's right to live that they risk their own lives. So of course, I grew up knowing that good people come in every religion, every ethnicity, every type of people, not just my own. I also grew up knowing that there was such a thing as loving someone or an idea so much that you would be willing to open the door, that you would be willing to risk your life for it. So there she was inside their house. Within just a few days, one of their neighbors became quite suspicious that the Yons were hiding a Jewish child, notified the Nazis, and they sent the SS there to find the child. And in fact, as they came in the house, Lisa Lott quickly jumped into the laundry bin. My mom's very petite today. When she was just 14, she was really petite. Into the laundry bin, all the towels and sheets on top of her. And the SS troops came in. They tore apart the walls. They tore apart the mattresses. They tore apart everything they could find. But they didn't look in the laundry bin. I guess I've never read this, but I guess the Nazis sort of weren't into doing laundry. Um, so luckily, they left. Their murderous intent foiled. The next night, Lisa Lott was back out on the street, not because the Yons had thrown her out, but because she knew if she stayed there, that family would probably be killed. And at that point, she made a choice. And she made a choice to go to the one person who she thought might possibly help. That was the father of one of her friends from school who had said if she ever needed help or the family needed help to come to him. So once again, in hopes that she wouldn't be recognized, she returned to central Vienna. She went to the address she had been given. She walked up the stairs of the building. She asked the receptionist for the father of her, her friend, her school friend and was quite surprised when the man immediately stood up, saluted her, and accompanied her personally to the man's office. It was only when she saw the huge office that she realized that her friend's father was one of the most senior SS officials in the entire country. Needless to say, he was a little surprised to see her there. He yelled at her, never! to come there again, but he also was true to his word. He listened to her story, and in the next few days, found her father, who was imprisoned in one of the makeshift um, prison areas that they had still on the outskirts of Vienna. This was early in the war. Uh, unfortunately, at that point, he'd been beaten so badly that he no longer recognized Lee Slot. But he also secured four exit visas for them to leave the country. Good following evil, evil following good. All of us have choices. In every moment of our life, we have choices. And we can choose good or we can choose evil. We can choose beauty or we can choose ugliness. I come into the world knowing that I was born because of the unconditional love of my great-grandma Nina, because of the absolutely extraordinary courage of the Yon family, and because a man of evil chose in the moment to act for good. So if we pause for a moment, if I pause for a moment, and ask, what does this story have to do with today? What does this story have to do with the 21st century, with the society and the economy of the 21st century? What does this story have to do with success in the 21st century? Is the answer that it's strictly a story of history, or does it have a message still for us today? 
And the answer from many people may be that it has nothing to do with today. It's a part of history. That was all 75, more than 75 years ago. But I think the answer is quite different. And if I ask the question, not at the level of an individual family, but at the level of a society and the level of an economy, and say, what would happen if our companies sculpted their missions, their strategies, and their behaviors with love, and let financial success be a consequence of love rather than the number one goal? Would I be fantasizing? Would I be um, happily delusional? Would I be naive? And as I look, I can look under the lights if I'm really carefully careful. I know that every one of you is thinking of at least one company somewhere that's doing exactly that. When I think about it, I think we're at a very interesting moment in history because the single fastest growing company in the history of the world, not just at the moment, but in the history of the world, is just such a company. The company by name is Coursera. The company's business is that it's taken an idea that's become quite popular, you could say it's gone viral, called the MOOC and turned it into a very interesting business. A MOOC is a massively open online course. So what Coursera is doing is it's taking education, giving it away completely free, as taught by the best professors in the world, and sending it out to the millions and millions of people who are bright, who are motivated, but who otherwise wouldn't have any access to such education. Coursera was founded less than two years ago. It already has 2.3 million clients and growing from 196 different countries. Pretty impressive until you start listening to the disparagers. They're always disparagers. They're even more when somebody's busy being successful. Hmm. What do the disparagers say? The disparagers say, it's a passing fad, it'll just go away. I'm not betting on that side. The disparagers say, this isn't a business, it's a charity. Giving education away for free isn't a business model. Huh, let's look at that one for a minute. Come back to the story of Nina. Nina's unconditional love for people that she was condemned never to meet was what allowed her to give the next generation life. Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng, the two Stanford professors who founded Coursera, oh, by the way, as a for-profit company, so passionately love the idea of all those people around the world who, if they learn, will be able to improve their own lives, the lives of their families, the lives of their communities, and make the world a better place, that even though they'll never meet all those millions of people, they're still acting out of unconditional love. But that comes back to the business model. They walked into this not knowing how they would fund it. They walked into it committed non-negotiably to not charging tuition, not charging any of the students for the courses. But last summer, some things started to change. They didn't start changing tu charging tuition, and they won't. But what they did discover is, hmm, who around the world would be really interested in knowing who the really bright, motivated, self-disciplined people are who have a certain expertise, who've completed certain courses? Hmm, every company in the world. It's called recruiting the best people. So Coursera now can slice and dice their 2.3 million graduates and growing and help companies find the very best people. It's a pretty good revenue source. And oh, by the way, they don't have a commitment to not charging 
companies who want that information. They also have these courses like entrepreneurship where all of these people, some of the courses are 176,000 people all in one course. Another course is 126,000. These are huge courses. So one course is entrepreneurship course where they do projects. And the professor, also a Stanford professor, realized that the projects were really good and shouldn't be course projects. They should, in fact, be projects that happen, actually are actualized in the world. So he went next door to Silicon Valley and said, hey, you venture capitalists, are you interested in finding out about the best projects in the world that have come from the brightest people in the world that have been vetted by 126,000 people before they sifted up to which are the best projects? You want to guess if the venture capitalists were interested? You want to guess if they were willing to pay? Do I need to finish that sentence? Daphne and Andrew are not going to charge the people to learn so that they can create a better world. But yes, my bet is they'll stay in business. Bottom line for the company is that it was their love of people to create a more beautiful world that created the company. What are the choices? People, neither people nor companies, are born good or evil. We all make choices. We make choices every day. But we can't make choices if we don't have the sense of possibility, if we don't have the sense that we can choose to do good, if we don't have the sense that it's possible to dare to care, if we don't have the sense that maybe I would have the courage, I don't know, but maybe possibly I would have the courage to open the door. Leadership is about creating epidemics of possibility. Courage is about imagining possibility and then acting on it. Courage and possibility come together when we inspire other people to choose possibility. Leadership is about creating epidemics of courage and possibility. If you bring courage and possibility together, the outcome is not applause. The outcome is beauty. The beauty of daring to care. The beauty of opening the door. The beauty of launching Coursera. In this ugly world, the only true protest is beauty. But there's no way we'll have the protest. There's no way we'll have the beauty if we don't reclaim our inheritance of unconditional love. We are all standing at the train station, waving, because we know that with possibility and courage, we are capable of creating a more beautiful world. We are all standing on the train platform, waving. Thank you, Nina. We all thank you. <laughs>